Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar today on changing paradigms for learning and development in the workplace and the role of technology. I'm Ben Wagner from Web Anywhere and firstly thank you all for coming today and I hope you find this session useful. I'm very happy to introduce our presenter today, Phil Aspen, the founder of eGenius. Phil has extensive experience both in organizational change and using technology for learning. And I'm excited to hear his thoughts on how learning is changing. We'll open up for questions at the end, but if you want to get in touch with us afterwards, you'll find all our details on webanywhere.org. So, Phil, over to you. Thank you very much, Ben, and welcome to everybody who's, who's on the webinar now. So, the title of the webinar is Changing Paradigms for Learning and Development and Discussing the Role that Technology Has in both driving that and enabling that. So I thought it'd be good if we started off by just explaining what we mean by a paradigm. And the particular paradigms that we're going to be talking about are, uh, first of all, this one. Um, this is actually a, a library. And this can also be described as a learning environment. I have to reveal at this, time, at this point that I am actually a recovering librarian, so this is something that I know quite a lot about. Uh, and within this type of learning environment, it's what I would describe as the pull paradigm. And the skills that we use in that uh, environment are those of curating the resources to get them so that people can access them, and actually facilitating people's access to them. The internet and Google, of course, is another pull paradigm. And we can contrast that with teaching and training as a push paradigm. And in the push paradigm, the information and the learning is presented from the front. Um, we could also uh, say that the push paradigm applies to e-learning as well, particularly linear e-learning where you could click and test and assess and all the rest of it. Um, so having introduced those two, what I, I want to introduce you to this wonderful mythical beast, which you may have heard of before, it's called the Push Me Pull You. And one of the things I want to use it for is to illustrate the fact that actually what we use in our workplaces are a combination of both push and pull. However, this model as it stands, in other words, the Push Me Pull You with two equally sized heads is actually wrong. If we were to use this to represent the push and the pull in terms of learning and development, you would see that you had a, a pull head that was about nine-tenths of the total size and a push head that was about one-tenth of the size because that's the proportion it's claimed that we learn and develop in the workplace. So having got that out of the way, what I'd like to do now is just talk about the environment around that and the impact that that's having. So some of the external forces on us. The first one on that list is the consumerization of IT. Um, and this can be quite simply stated as what used to happen was that at home you had no IT or very little IT and at work that's where you accessed IT. Um, these days it's the opposite way around. Generally speaking, and it is a generalization, People have fantastic IT at home with great devices that can um, connect to each other. And at work, well, IT can frankly be a bit rubbish at times. Um, the Internet of Things is an interesting um, change that's happening. And this is uh, what this is, is all sorts of different devices uh, connecting to the Internet. So it will no longer be just smartphones and computers and tablets, but it could well be kettles, fridges, and toothbrushes. And the sort of information which will be produced by all of those things connecting to the internet is going to be absolutely phenomenal. Um, it's estimated that by 2020, there will be 30 billion wirelessly connected devices of all sorts. And just to put that in perspective, the population of the Earth is seven point something billion. Um, all of this is helping to gather even more pace in what we describe as the knowledge and information explosion. And since 2003, that has been extraordinary. Uh, just as an illustration of that, uh, every single day, 
a century's worth of video is uploaded to YouTube. So in other words, you would have to sit for 100 years watching dancing kittens and sneezing pandas, which would be some sort of purgatory. But nevertheless, it shows how much uh, information is being created by people out there, and some of it by organizations, but mainly by individuals. Then we've got the generation XYZ, um, and we've got uh, what people describe as digital natives, those born after the year 2000. And what they bring with them is a completely different attitude towards um, learning and work, and uh, a completely different attitude towards uh, digital devices and connectivity. Then we've got a very interesting model around social learning, which is 70-20-10. Um, and that describes the proportions in which we learn in the workplace. I'll come on to uh, describe that in a little bit more detail. Then we've got cloud and SAS. Cloud on its own would not be a particularly remarkable thing uh, because all you're doing is moving your servers onto the internet, making them remote. There are some advantages in that. But it's actually the SAS which stands for software as a service which makes quite a big difference because what that means is that the devices that we can we use are a lot smaller, a lot slimmer uh, and a lot more mobile because all of the processing happens up on servers on the internet not on the device itself so it makes a lot of things possible. And then at the end there I've just put the economy because we have to be aware that we are coming out of a recession and there's still a lot of recession based thinking uh, around. So let's have a look at the implications of this, and that's a glorious picture of uh, digital natives up in the corner there. Uh, the digital natives will expect to use technology, they won't expect to use anything else. They also have an expectation that information and knowledge is available now, and for librarians there's a very interesting word which is provenance, because information may be available, but how do we know that it's the right information and how do we know that it's, it's good? Um, the digital natives have higher expectations of technology. In fact, their expectation of technology is that it will work. Um, the majority of us on the, in fact, I imagine that all of us on this call are digital immigrants. In other words, we came into the digital age or grew into the digital age. Um, our expectation of technology is a kind of default, it won't work, and we're rather surprised when it does. Then we've got the issue of pervasive connectivity and mobile devices, so connected everywhere and all sorts of things connected. And the recognition now that training is actually a small part of an individual's development, not the main bit. And I think the last point is very important too. IT departments are losing control of what you can and can't do while you're in work, although there's still some remnants of them trying to uh, exercise that control. So if we go on to talk about 702010, this has a good background. It came from some good research, and it was uh, asking people how they felt they learned and developed and observed people learning and developing in the workplace. And these proportions come down to only 10% is actually as the result of formal training. 20% comes from feedback uh, and from working with, I would say this as working with a significant person in the workplace, and that could be your line manager or it might not be. And then this huge chunk, 70%, comes from real life and on-the-job experiences. In other words, people doing the job doing tasks and problem solving as they're doing it. Now I always offer the uh, caution here that what we're talking about is the proportion that people learn in, not necessarily the importance of those proportions. So when I have to go into hospital uh, and I have a surgeon, I will be very reassured to know that he has had his 10% of formal training. However, I hope that he or she has also had good experience uh, to bring to his, um, his work. So let's have a look at this um, in a little bit more detail and think about, well, how do we respond to this model as learning and development people? 
what it does really is it throws to the fore those um, skills that I talked about in the, the second slide around curation and facilitation. How do we create a learning environment in that 70% where people can access learning very easily and how do we facilitate their access to it? Performance management is, I think, a very important consideration for the 20%. In other words, how do we get people to interact well and therefore increase learning within that 20%? The 10% we know uh, uh, is really formal courses. We can sort of advertise those and people will go on to them. There are some activities which have always lived within the 70%. And one of the most powerful of those is action learning. And there is a question about can we use technology to um, have action learning in uh, environments where it might be difficult to be co-located or to be synchronous. And the same goes for coaching. Coaching is very powerful within the 70%. And we tend to default to a face-to-face -face model. But there are other models of coaching which we're beginning to explore. Um, what I want to look at now is, is, is an interesting uh, thought that occurred to me while I, I, I actually went into a marketing seminar um, by mistake. And I, I sat down and, and, and listened and became aware that actually this was beginning to very much tally with some of my thoughts around learning and development. And what they were presenting was these, what they described as marketing eras. What they were saying was that from the 1900s to 1960, it was a simple matter of informing people about the products that were out there. So in other words, that was a kind of a tell. They were simply telling people that the products were available and people were coming to buy them. In the consumer era, that seemed to change rather in that they were selling things to people. Presumably there were more competing products. And at the same time, um, it became a marketing tool to actually sell lifestyles to people. So, and then from 2000 onwards, the marketing people describe it as the relationship era, where marketing is about fostering sustainable relationships. So that's much more of a social um, uh, activity. Um, and we can see that this links very much to the 10%. We can just tell people about the 10%. The 20%, if you're working with a manager or a significant person, there may be some persuasion, there may be some direction involved there. And in the 70%, we need to create these sustainable relationships. And what I'm saying is that in order to really crack this 70%, we need to start thinking like marketing people. And we also need to start using technology in the way that marketing people are doing now, because they are using it in some quite remarkable ways. So that we can just understand about marketing a little bit more, I thought it was useful to pull up this explanation from Wikipedia. So they're saying that marketing there is about understanding consumer behavior and providing superb customer value. Okay, so we can see that as learning and development people that we need to start understanding the behavior of people in our organizations and providing learning and development where they need it. And that final uh, paragraph there satisfies these needs and wants with exchange processes and building long-term relationships. And again, that's where I think we really need to be in the business of building long-term relationships and having those sort of exchange processes. So. When we're talking about learning in that 70%, it's actually quite a difficult thing to grasp, quite literally. Um, and I put this slide up because what I want to illustrate here is that actually if we try to uh, bring the sort of control into this area that we bring into, say, the formal learning, then it's a bit like trying to pick a jelly up with your fingers and this sort of thing happens. It will tend to fragment, it will tend to liquefy, and actually what you'll end up doing is losing control of it rather than gaining control. So we need quite a different approach. But what I want to talk about now is how we might look at uh, what happens within the 20% in terms of performance management. And I want to introduce you to this graph, which I uh, devised after reading Situational Leadership uh, by Ken Blanchard. It's a very well-known book, uh, very well-respected book. And I uh, 
drew this from, uh, from his ideas. And what I want to use it for is just to explain the way that the relationship between um, a manager, say, and their, uh, an employee um, needs to be developed so that um, the employee develops in, in a good way through this process. But just to explain what's happening here. Um, if we were to say what we've got here is an employee who is just starting in the job, maybe it's a new job, um, or maybe they're just starting to work on a project in an unfamiliar area. What we can say is that they will tend to start with very high commitment, commitment being a combination of motivation and confidence. But they will start with low competence, that is their knowledge and skills is low. Now, they may be highly trained, but actually one of the things they're probably not used to is doing what they're doing in this context. So in other words, they've never done it here before, and that can represent a significant barrier. The first stage, um, the manager's reaction is down at the bottom, or the manager's um, that what the manager does in response is down at the bottom in the stages. And what Ken Blanchard suggests is that directing is the right um, response down at the bottom. Um, in other words, per, uh, the person needs to be told what to do at this stage in order to get them through that first stage and, and through the unfamiliarity of it all. In stage two, we need to concentrate a little bit more on coaching. In other words, in other words uh, easing off on the telling a little bit and allowing the person to develop their own solutions and their own thinking. When we get into the third stage, it's perhaps we could describe it as even more coaching, so we just support them as they go through this stage. Now, interestingly, in stage two, there's a potential crisis point uh, where you can see that commitment plummets. Um, although competence is actually rising, but they may not be particularly aware of that as that's happening. In the third stage, they're sort of getting it at those peaks, and then they're realizing that they really haven't got it at all in the troughs. And that is a very rocky road, but nevertheless, the manager can support them through that. When we get to the final stage, we can see that uh, the manager can start delegating things to the employee. And when we say delegating things, I mean delegating responsibilities, not just tasks. So this interesting graph shows how managers can work with people and how they might support them in that performance management. And as part of that, might actually move them towards uh, learning and development, um, not just formal learning and development, but through reflecting with them and in order to develop their uh, skills on the job. Um, so let's have a look at the 70%, because in the 70%, um, we've got uh, a consideration about knowledge management and intellectual capital. And that is a quote from IBM, which I always think is, is, is very important. If IBM knew what IBM knows, we would be unstoppable. In other words, IBM has a huge amount of intellectual capital and knowledge, but actually finds it rather difficult to get to it, which I think is, is, is something that most organizations would, would probably identify with. So one of the things that comes into this space of, 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 of the 70% is the idea of social learning. And when we're talking about social learning, we're talking about things which can complement formal programs. We can characterize the formal programs as learn to learning. In other words, it takes a while to learn to do something. Uh, and you may need to go out of the workplace in order to do that. However, with social learning, we're talking about on-the-job learning. And what we're talking about largely is just-in-time solutions, or we can characterize it as go-to learning. And there's this phrase, heuristics, uh, about go-to learning. What that means is that you may find solutions which are uh, good at the time, get you past that particular thing, but actually they're not optimal. In other words, they're not the best solution available. The way that we can convert go-to learning into 
even better solutions is by good reflection and the learning that comes from reflection on those go-to um, solutions. Then there's the issue about in this space, how do we capture that knowledge and how do we start transferring it? So how do we capture all this stuff that's going on and how do we start to get it back to people? Well, if you look at the success of social networks, you can begin to see how people might create their own solution to that by actually putting things on social networks and talking about it with other people. And one of the things that, that has been found is that actually if you start to make some simple changes, moving things from what you might describe as a traditional login and access your learning, learning management system to a social platform, you get an increase of about 40% in usage. I would also suggest that probably what we're looking at there is the reduction of relatively long courses down to quite simple pieces of information. Uh, I just thought I'd throw in this quote here. This is from uh, the CEO of, of Google and it's quite astounding really. Um, it just illustrates how much information is being created and largely it's being created on social networks and, and social sites. Every two days we now create as much information as we did from the dawn of civilization up until 2003. I'm still staggered every time I read that. And as I said, because of increases in connectivity, etc., we're going to see an increase in that. Um, one of the things that we need to consider in response to these changes is how our LMS itself might change, our learning management system. And this is a diagram from Charles Jennings, who's credited with a lot of the work on the 70-20-10 model, and himself was a learning and development uh, officer. And what you can see there is this development of the LMS <clears throat> where in the early days it simply mirrored a training administration system. In other words, it saw who had gone on what training and it put that training in front of them. And then we've gone through these different approaches around talent management, about brand identity, and now we're in the internal communications and the social era. We've got something called personal knowledge management. And the interesting question uh, for learning management systems is how they evolve in order to meet that change. And my own particular thoughts on this is actually that the learning management system will become less visible. That is, you won't find yourself logging into it in order to do your learning uh, quite so much. You may find that that learning is pushed to you in various ways through apps or, or whatever. But actually, in the background, it will be more important because it will be picking up the information, it will be looking at the behaviors of people and when they're accessing that learning and how they're accessing the learning. So less visible and yet more important. Uh, this is my final slide and I just want to talk through this as an interesting model that illustrates the way that marketing people think. And we can maybe think about this in terms of our own uh, working environment. This is one that everybody knows reasonably well. This is IKEA and the way that IKEA um, uh, deal with their customers in terms of these dreaming, exploring, locating and understanding what they describe as the new customer journey. So what's interesting about IKEA is that every 12 months you will get an IKEA catalog that drops through your door. Uh, but you can't buy anything from that catalog. The reason you get that catalog is mainly to intrigue you, to start you thinking about what your home could look like and to give you some interesting examples. So from that catalog you might go directly to a store or you may go to the website. If you go to the website there are some tools on there that help you think a little bit more, that help you develop your ideas about what you want. When you go to the IKEA store, which you may very well do in the end because you can buy off the website, but you probably want to go and see what the thing looks like in real life. When you get there, you wander around endless showrooms before you get down to the warehouse. 
and I would challenge anybody who goes into an IKEA store to go through the showroom and not get some extra ideas for things to pick up in the warehouse when they actually get there. And of course, in IKEA you can make an entire day of it. You can go in the restaurant and have uh, Swedish food in the restaurant, and you can drop the kids in the play area and go up and look at the the the, the rooms. So it's this kind of thinking about how people behave, what will intrigue them, what will motivate them, how they move through the processes that uh, uh, IKEA wants them to move through. And that's the kind of thinking that we need to start introducing to learning and development. And I'll end there and uh, pass back to Ben to see if there's any questions that people want to ask. Thank you very much, Phil. I hope you all enjoyed listening to that as much as I did, and uh, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, as Phil said, if anyone does want to ask a question, please feel free to drop it into the, the chat or the questions, and we'll respond to them now. Uh, if not, for those who, uh, who didn't see the messages right at the beginning, uh, we are recording this session, so we'll be putting it online probably in the next couple of days once we've got that all processed. Uh, so feel free to you know share it around and, and pass it out to people. Make sure we get the links sent out to everyone. Not seen any questions appear just yet. So uh, thank you once again, Phil, for your okay. your time today. I think it's been a really good session. Hopefully you've all gained a few things from it. And if you want to get in touch later on, uh, you should already have our contact details. But you can get us through webanywhere.org. And feel free to send us a message, uh, either to us generally, or we can forward things on to Phil if you've got any particular questions. So thank you very much. I hope everyone has a great rest of the day and rest of the week, and hopefully hear from you all soon.